Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today we continue with the sixth turn of the Shadow Tech Goddess, subtitled Cat, Part 4, Chapter 8, Gelt, Part 1. Just uh, chapter Gelt is the second to last chapter in the book, and it is horrendously long. It is just about 30 pages, and there is no way, no way I'm going to read 30 pages. This video would be two hours long. It's just not feasible. So I'm going to chop it right down the center. I found a, a good stopping point in the center of this chapter. So I will be reading part one of Gelt, and next week will be part two. Also, next week will be the final chapter, which is called Lunch by the Sea, and it's only three pages long. But then that is the end of the book, when we are at the exciting conclusion. Previous chapter, Lord Belmont and Cat discover and encounter the demonic spirit Carahill, who had hidden himself away, or in the Valley of the Moons. He had turned God's temple into a horrid, decrepit place where he could wallow in his guilt for not saving Xandar. Fortunately, our dynamic duo was able to convince him that life is strong and that it was, in fact, returning to Xandar at a slow but steady rate. They showed him the proof, a little thorny flower, which actually happens to be Ethelberry, which is the plant of the gods, which is actually a very potent plant, but none of them were aware of that. And a small bug that was feeding on Shadow Tech, as it is in, in abundance on Xandar. Carahill realizes that life is returning, and they free him from his demonic shackles, and he becomes his silvery, smiling self again, as he, as he is in other League of Elder books. I also found that the horrific robot page that Cat had taken over with her STTs became infused with her centrils when I, when Kara Hill attacked their bow and it, the centrils went inside of her body and with the mystical power fueling her she grew a an organic left half of the body and eventually she shed her robotic half becoming all like an organic creature uh, anything she would touch would sprout out of her body she ate some a little bit of chicken that they had in her basket and then she starts sprouting live chickens from her body app same with apples water you name it. anything she touches out it comes and she becomes the abundant woman and i thought that was a, a good addition let's dig in shall we part four chapter eight part one of Gelt. Suddenly, they were on a rain-drenched world of heavy gray cloud and pelting rain, their boots and feet sinking into the oozing waterlogged ground. They were instantly soaked to the bone. Where are we, Stenstrom asked, shouting to be heard. Cat stood there in the rain, looking like a waterlogged mouse. Purple lights, a figure approached. It was Aetha, standing in the rain, Though she was completely dry and untouched by mud, the rain seemed to fall around her. Oh, creation, 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 she said, all smiles. Look what you did for my father. I saw it all. I shed tears, real tears. Me, you two have my eternal favor, and I mean it. Aetha whirled about in the rain that was not touching her body, dancing in the mud that did not dirty her boots. Hey, I'm sorry about the rain and the mud. Let me take care of it. She raised her arms, and the blanket of rain was diverted, cast aside like a swarm of bees crashing to the ground. You guys did great. Did I already tell you that? You did, Stenstrom said. Both he and Kat stood there like drenched rabbits, steaming slightly. Well, it bears repeating. Aetha looked around. Some place, huh? This is Gelt, a rather rural world in the remote backwater of the League. Thanks to our friend Fiddler Crow at Mons Eagle, we know exactly where to enter Bella Thouser's horror realm. She held her arms out. Right here it is. Fabulous spot for it. Suitably depressing and uncomfortable as one might expect. Stenstrom looked around, seeing nothing but sheets of falling rain, machine gunning the ground, and a flat expanse of mud and limp 
grass. Here, Aetha pointed to the ground. Down there, about 50 feet, they looked at the ground, seeing an ocean of mud. You know the story of this place, Aetha asked. There used to be seven earthen hills here. The locals called them the Seven Wives, after the Sisterhood of Light. Aetha looked at the flat landscape. No more hills, are there? The hills were raised to the ground about 30 years ago by Sigillus of Metatron. Ring any bells? Stenstrom knew the story. He knew the tale. Aetha told it, saying things he already knew. Aetha continued, The Triumph was a brand new warship for the Stellar Fleet, huge and grand. In her jealousy, the Zaffin criminal and social light, Princess Marleth of Xandar, stole the ship with her fellows and tried to murder Captain Davidge and his betrothed, Sigillus of Metatron. After a heated battle in space, Sigillus managed to steal aboard the Triumph and confront the princess personally. This place is where the Triumph fell out of the sky and plowed into the ground like a meteorite as Sigillus single-handed fought Princess Marleth and her fanatics of Nulls, putting to death every soul on that ship, impaling them on spikes like a forest of the dead. Like my father, Sigillus injured and alone facing the horrors of what she had done on the Triumph went mad. She leveled the seven wives in the hope of covering the Triumph and everything else to hide what she had done. This is where Captain Davidge came and saved her a second time. And here the Triumph has remained, buried, after only one flight, a shipwreck on dry land, too horrible to be dug up and refurbished. Aetha kicked at the mud. The interior of the Triumph is the entrance to Bella Thouser's realm. Fiddler Crow's calculations prove it. We dug a hole to get to it, and now here it is, 50 feet down. Stenstrom and Kat stared at the mud. Kat hugged herself, placing her head into Stenstrom's chest. I don't like small buried spirits. Pieces. It'll be all right, love. I promise. So, Bella Thouser's down there. So, too, is your anatometer and your revenge if you still want it, Aetha said. I could scour away all this mud, but I prefer you two to do it. The universe likes it that way. Then I guess we dig, Kat said. Stenstrom handed her a squash capsule and she broke it against her forehead. We dig hard, she said again in a more forceful voice. Stand back! Stenstrom and Aetha stepped back. Cat first created a roof larger than the area of no rain Aether had made. From the roof, she created a powerful drill head out of silver tech and began digging. A geyser of debris shot into the air as the drill head did its work, quickly biting into the drenched ground. Aether funneled the debris away. It wasn't long before Cat hit metal. She retracted the drill head, setting it aside in the mud, allowing the rain to stream off its impressive teeth. They peered down into the hole, seeing nothing but a dark tube going into the ground. Cat swirled her hands about, creating a shining egg-shaped ball of silver tech. I'm creating a few Belmont buzzers. I'll have them scout out ahead and see what's down there. Can I uh, borrow a few more of your yellow holy stones? The silver tech formed into the wiggling shape of several large cockroaches, a standard STT shape, small and versatile. Gods, I love these little guys. They totally rock. Stenstrom waved up four yellow holy stones, shaking them into yellow glow. The STTs took the holy stones in their front legs and flew down into the hole Cat had cut, the light from the holy stones panning about like a group of miners descending into the dark. Down below, buried about 50 feet, the STTs hit metal. Glinting in the yellow light was a hint of the cursed ship triumph. It was soiled and dingy, like a dug-up fossil. Stenstrom was apprehensive. After all he had heard about this ship, all the horrific things that had happened within, seeing it in person was a bit ghastly. He knew Triumph class ships fairly well, having been assigned to one for several years, but he couldn't get a bearing on what he was looking at at what portion of the ship. I think that's the aft ventral quarter lower decks, Aetha said, looking into the hole. She's nose down at a fairly acute angle. Cat lined the wall of the hole with a smooth layer of silver tech. She added a winding set of stairs, and slowly they made their way down. Wait, Aetha said. I think this is the end. If all goes well, you probably won't see me again. The gods tend to lose themselves in time. The next time I'm on Cana might be centuries from now. Just know how I love you, and should we meet again, you might not know me, but I'll know you. Aetha wiped a tear from her face. 
Both Stenstrom and Kat felt a warm kiss on their cheeks. Go on. Good luck, Aetha said, fading away. I love you guys, her voice echoed. They continued on. The exposed bit of the ship loomed large, like a rising coffin uncovered from its grave. They reached the bottom. The metal of the ship was stained a putrid reddish-brown color in the STT's light. I could find no access points to enter. Cat, using her silver tech, cut a deep hole through the thick metal plating. Blackness and foul air came rushing out. It was very dark within. Very little of the interior of the ship could be seen. The ST TTs crawled in, illuminating a small area of the corridor inside. Before he could take a step, Cat nimbly crawled in and vanished. Stenstrom knelt down and peered in. Cat! Cat! He didn't see her anywhere inside. He folded himself up and climbed in after her. The air inside the ship was thick and hard to breathe, laced with unpleasant scents. He had to grab onto the nearest wall. The ship was steeply pitched downward with no working gravity. It was difficult to maintain his footing. Yellow lights from the STT bobbed about, creating a nightmarish amber effect before him. Cat, where are you? It was morbidly quiet. Cat! In the distance, Kat emerged, sitting on all fours near a side wall. She was peering down a long corridor that trailed off into the dark. She bounded back to his side, finding purchase on the walls and ceiling. Her agility, even in this compromised footing, was unmatched. This place has a bad feel to it, G, she said. I agree. They made their way down the corridor, Stenstrom having to hang on to whatever he could on the walls with every step. Cat bounded ahead. Come on, G, use your TK and let's go. She leapt ahead, the light carrying STTs following. He tried lifting off with TK and gliding down, but nothing happened. Nothing happened. Where was the sister's power? With no TK, he had to make his careful way down, hanging on to the insulated plumbing pipes. Eventually, he caught up to Cat. Stenstrom slid down to a four-way intersection and held there for a moment. Murky darkness waited beyond. The light-bearing STTs lingered there in the open space, hesitant to go forward. Where are we, G? Cat asked. Somewhere in the aft of the ship. I'm guessing deck three or four. We're going to have to traverse up before long into the higher decks, twenty and upwards. Can we send the buzzards forwards to scout? Cat called the STTs to her. They bobbed before her face, lighting it up. I need you guys to go forward, okay? Let me see what you see. Go on. The STTs wandered ahead through the intersection. Why did you ask them to move forward? Why not just command them to go? These buzzers are like our children. It never hurts to be polite. They waited in the dark a few minutes. See anything? He asked. Cat gazed off into the darkness. Nothing so far, just a sad empty ship. Wait, wait, I see something ahead lining the walls. Can't quite make it out. The STTs are approaching. She was quizzical and questioning. What is that? What, darling? Cat sucked in her breath. She recoiled. Gee, they're bodies. Bodies? Yes, many of them. Down the passageway about a hundred feet. There's a lot of them. They're oddly preserved. They appear ruddy and fresh, as if they've been newly killed. The bodies are stuck up on the walls, on Shadowtech spikes like a flippin' scarecrow. Stenstrom shuddered. I've heard stories of the battle that took place on this ship. The Countess of Blanchford alone against Princess Marlith of Xandar and her fanatics of Nals. Those bodies must be the corpses of the fanatics. The lady I'm going to be taking lessons from did all this? Cat asked. She did in a moment of pain and insanity. Wow, it's pretty scary down there, G, Kat said. Creation, I want to go home. She bounded a few paces into the dark, Stenstrom following as best he could in the unsteady footing. Kat was fastened against the wall, having no trouble with the footing. Seeing him struggle, she offered him her silver tech tail to use as a handle to hold onto, which he gratefully accepted. The dark quickly swallowed them up as they made their way down the corridor. Up ahead, they could see a distant flickering of yellow light, the STTs, oddly festive and alive in this horrendous charnel house of death. Cat scrabbled along the wall, using her claws to stick her on like a gecko, Stenstrom holding on to her tail for support. Aside from the dank atmosphere, sour with old decay and mold, there was a terrible heaviness in the air, a dark taint that got worse with every step. It made them both shudder. Every so often, Cat looked back at him to make sure he was still there. You alright? He asked her, tightly gripping her tail. I'm fine. 
Anything more from the buzzers? Just more bodies. Lots of them. Soon, they passed into a solid forest of robe bodies. The protruding branches of limbs with the floating will-o'-wisps of the STTs lighting them up. The bodies were tacked up on the sides of the corridor like hard pieces of preformed art. Some were upside down, some were positioned parallel to the floor, and others were stuck up on the ceiling, all nailed in place with curved silver tech spikes, just as shiny and sharp as the day they were formed. The material of the robes they wore reeked of must and old fabric. And, as Kat had mentioned, their pain-contoured bodies appeared quite fresh. The horror etched on their faces seemed newly formed, their mouths locked open in dead screams. In order to avoid the bodies, Kat leapt down onto the floor, her silver tech claws digging in and continued. Every so often, there was an empty spot amid the mosaic of hanging corpses, as if there had been a body there at one time, but which was now gone. Stenstrom stopped to puzzle over this. Why is there no body here? Where did it go? Kat craned her neck up. Seems like a body should be there. Perhaps it fell down at some point and tumbled away. She scrabbled up the side of the wall, moving quickly, silently, over the hummocky terrain of bodies and shadow tech spikes, and inspected the empty space. Look here, she said, investigating a particular spot, her tail flicking. There's a hole in the wall where something had been jammed through. A shadow tech spike? Looks like it. So where'd it go? I don't know. Stenstrom didn't like this one little bit. She leapt down. Gee, one of the buzzers is seeing something different now. It's reached a platform of some sort. There's a lot of wreckage all around, as if the interior has been hollowed out somehow. Hollowed out? Looks to be. The buzzer is climbing down now to have a better look. There's a pit heading down at an acute angle. Let me see. Kat's eyes grew wide. She reacted. Gee, the bottom of the pit is full of body parts. Body parts? Yes, like they've been tossed in there. Arms, legs, torsos, heads. They look to be armored somehow. These parts aren't dressed in robes like the bodies here in the corridor. Cat grabs Stenstrom's appels. The buzzer is hearing all sorts of things. There's something alive in that pit. Can you move the buzzer around to get a better look? I'm trying, but something just attacked the buzzer. I got a glimpse of something moving at speed for it, and then it dropped the holy stone. The buzzer is terminated. It exploded, taking whatever attacked it with it as well, if luck is with us. Oh, creation, G. Got those body parts. I think that's what Aetha was talking about, our immortal ancestors from Camera. This is Bella Thouser's realm, filled with pieces and parts, the Grundids, she called them. He closed his eyes, and there's one more thing I need to tell you. Cat anticipated his response. The sister's power. Is it gone? He looked around and took a deep breath. Yes. It comes from starlight. Here in the depths, it cannot reach. I have no enhanced strength, no invulnerability, and I have no TK. I was wondering why you weren't TKing. Then you stay here, G. I'll go on. You're not going on alone. I'm not helpless. I still have Tyrol's sorcery. I still have my ints. That, coupled with your silver tech, should be enough. What are we about to face here, G? Creatures that cannot die? How are we going to do this? As best we can, for everything we know, for the home we wish to have and the life we wish to forge, we must be swift and we must be successful. They held on to each other for a few moments. Oh, how I love you, she said. Just hold on to my tail and don't let go, okay? They moved deeper into the ship, getting their bearings. Looks to be we're in one of the cargo holds. I'm not sure which one. There are four on a Triumph-class vessel. Stenstrom shook up another yellow holy stone and held it cupped in his hand, directing the light like a torch. Scattered around the room were broken and tumbled cargo containers. Windows looked out on compacted earth. They appeared to be alone in the room. No dead bodies, no grundeds. And he boldly presented the holy stone. Let's make a point to remember this location. If we need to make a fast exit, we can exit through the window and burrow upward. Cat agreed. He produced a marzable dagger and plunged it into a container. Now with the dagger planted here, I'll be able to zero in on it without fail. That's a trick I've used in the past. Ahead was the closed door exiting the main corridor. They approached cautiously. Do you have any buzzers left? I recall you creating three in total. There's one left, I think, but the holy stone's gone out. It's in the dark somewhere in the ship. I, I don't know where. 
My poor buzzer, I want to get it and us out of here. They cracked the door open and Kat sent a tentative streamer of silver tech out to investigate the hallway. I don't think there's anything out there. Gee, I, I can't see much, but I'm not feeling anything. I think it's clear. She retracted her stream. Stenstrom drew his ends and checked the Cinnabar strikers. I'm wondering what the effect of my ints will be as these Grundeds are supposedly immortal and apparently unkillable. Guess we're gonna find out. Covering the Holy Stone, they opened the door and spilled out into the corridor. It was dark and silent. Following the acute slant down, they went as quietly as they could, Cat helping him with the terrible footing. Soon, they came upon another four-way intersection. Stenstrom stumbled with the angle, and Cat helped right him with her tail. There was a guide plate. Stenstrom approached it and carefully shone his light on it. Okay, okay, okay. This is junction L27, so as we thought, we're in the lower section of the ship towards the aft end. If we move on an intersection or two, we should come to a lift and we could head upwards. They continued past the intersection. Green light appeared. There was movement in the distance and a sound. They hid themselves as best they could against the left-hand wall and readied. A synthesized sound echoed out from the dark, creating a humming sort of speech. Bethor. Something that appeared to be a disembodied arm emerged from the darkness, carrying its own green light like a spacefaring vessel. It was moving like a snake, easily gliding along the ground. It was a left arm, the fingers of the hands slightly tapping along the floor. It was wearing tight-fitting articulated armor that went all the way up to the shoulder joint, where it ended in an elaborate gear-like knob. Strong green lights ran up the length of the arm. The fingernails on the hand were replaced by sharp-looking metal claws. The arm appeared utterly hostile and belligerent. As they hid in the shadows, the crawling arm went past, casting them in a green pall. Bethor! Came a synthesized sound from it as it continued forward. The hand froze, seemed puzzled. A tiny panel in its armor lifted, and a fat panning beam of blue light issued forth bathing the corridor in a sweeping arc this way and that. Before they could react, the beam caught them and held. The arm wheeled around. Sulfids! came a sound. The arm tensed as if ready to spring. Cat quickly pinned it to the ground with a surge of silver tech. The arm struggled, looking like a fish caught in a deadly net. Stenstrom cocked his hammers and leveled his ints. Cat, drop the silver tech. Let it go. If I shoot your silver tech, it could kill you too. Are you ready? She cried. He took aim. Ready. She released the silver tech and with incredible speed, the arm surged out and came at Cat. She sprang away and the hands metal claws dug into the corridor wall, missing her by mere moments. Stenstrom fired his ints, hitting the arm square with both shots. Nothing happened. The arm continued after Cat. A panel opened on its armored sleeve. It fired a rapidly pulsing red energy beam at Cat, who just had time to leap away. Stenstrom took aim and fired again, hitting the weapon and it went dead. Unlike the hand, the armor's robotic systems appeared to be fully subject to the ints' killing power. More panels opened in the armor. Four curved blades emerged and began spinning. The hand sprang at Cat again. Thump! One marzible buried itself in the arm's wrist, pinning it in mid-flight to the wall. Thump! A second marzible. Thump! And a third. The arm was solidly pinned to the wall, the deadly daggers having cleanly penetrated the armor. He went to Cat. You alright? Yes, yes! Producing more marzibles and holding them at the ready, Denstrom knelt down and inspected the impaled arm. Its hand clenched and unclenched. It strained to free itself. Its claws furrowed into the metal wall. Bethor! Bethor! Came the sounds over and over again. Gee, this is terrifying. Can this thing be real? It must, and it's immune to my ints. What is Bethor? She asked. Nothing good, I'm certain. He inspected it with his holy stones. Its armor was a soft, foamy green and was delicately jointed together. The arm furiously worked, trying to free itself. One of the marzibles came loose. 
With a swipe of her hand, Kat quartered the arm in a micro-beam of shadow tech formed from her fingers. Another swipe and she cubed it into a steaming pile of metal and sundered flesh. The sundry bits of dice flesh continued to move. In their minds, they could hear it wail in anguish. They covered their ears, but there was no drowning it out. It was the most pitiful sound they had ever heard. Stenstrom shook his hand, producing several red holy stones. What are you going to do? Cat asked. I'm going to burn it. Put it out of its misery. Fire consumes all. Stenstrom threw the holy stones and the pieces caught fire, burning in an oily smoke that sank to the floor in a greasy film and lingered there. That was very kind of you came an accented elfin voice from behind. They both whirled around, ready to be attacked by a host of fresh horrors. A steady ticking came from the dark reaches of the corridor, like the regular beat of a metronome. Tick, 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 tick. The voice came again between the beats. You gave the nasty, death-dealing, grunted peace. Moving with refined grace that defied the steeply pitched corridor, a cloaked figure emerged from the dark. It was a slender man, dainty and somewhat feminine in appearance, wearing a silvery pair of leggings, light boots, and a heavy cloak. The steady ticking came from the man, from an odd geared device hanging at his throat. Identify yourself, Stenstrom said, holding two marzibles and his nth. The man put his hood down, revealing a pretty face and thin yellowish hair. My name is rather long and difficult for a tongue under 100,000 years of age to pronounce. My traveling name is Fiddler Crow. I favor that name. Fun times. I know your ways. I'm an occasional visitor here. He pointed at Stenstrom. You are Stenstrom, Lord of Belmont, South Tyrol. He turned to Cap. And you, you are Tara de la Anderson, yes? No, she replied. Who? Are you Lady Gwendolyn Apprentice? No. Then you must be Lady Miranda Russell, or perhaps... Cat was becoming angry. I am none of those people. I am Cat, First Countess of Belmont, South Tyrol. The man appeared surprised. He ticked in contemplation. Hmm. Oh, yes. I see your Covis. Always elusive, the Covis. Ah, well, such is the complexity of things. She fumed, feeling a bit left out. How do you know who I am? Stenstrom demanded. I'll spare you the details, as you have no time. You told me yourself who you are. There was a different version of you in a different timeline. I am here repairing a debt that I owe you, and I am performing my part of the bargain that was struck between the two of us. Me? More extra planar nonsense? If you like. You, sir, save my wife, Queen Wendell Knight, and for that, I am in your debt. You and that lovely woman you were with, Melazar Caroline. Oh, Melazar, Cat said happily. We know her. I will honestly say she was much more attractive and clearly more capable than this small person you have here in this reality. Cat turned red with anger, but she held her tongue. The smoke from the burning arm clung to the hallway and made them cough. Crow waved his arm and spoke to the smoke. Go on, you're free. Drift about, make friends with the universe. You certainly don't deserve it. Who are you talking to? Stenstrom asked. The Grunded. Oh, it's not dead, if that what you thought. You set it free, changed it into a reventol. A what? Are you implying that burning doesn't kill? Of course burning doesn't kill. Burning releases it into trace elements and free molecules, just as immortal as ever. In a few hundred years, it'll learn how to manipulate itself in such a state. Turn it itself into a sort of ghost of cinders. My assistant, Famila, in the Library of Time is just such an amalgamation of such creatures. It can even enter your body and take you over. Fortunately, these Grundids aren't overly intelligent and fear burning and the freedom it offers. He looked down the corridor. Come, we have no time. Tick, 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 
Dubiously, they followed him down the gloomy corridor. Stenstrom instantly noticed something. How are we walking so easy? This vessel is pitched forward at a steep angle. I've been struggling with it ever since we entered. Yet now, we are walking as if perfectly level. Gravity is not my king, Crow said. Walk easy in my presence. Could have used you earlier, Cat said. Of course. That was somewhat a relief. Stenstrom had many questions, but saved them. The results were enough for now. Why are you ticking? Cat demanded as they walked. It reminds me that time for you moves at an insanely rapid pace. Time means nothing to me. My wife and I have momentary conversations that for you would seem to last decades. This errand I am performing for you has forced me to enter into a ridiculously rapid time pacing. I am eager to conclude matters here and resume my usual routine. And you are immortal? I am. Do not look to the uncouth grundeds as an example. Immortality, when properly measured and disciplined, is a marvelous gift. Fun times. I am hundreds of thousands of years old. He turned and lightly stepped down a side hallway. You realize I created the anatomata you lost. You? Cat said. You're responsible for this mess? I created the device to the specifications the goddess Aetha gave me. What happens to it after that is not my concern. Stenstrom had questions. I recall the goddess Aetha mentioning your name. For what purpose was this device built? To create a new, separate version of you, the all-in-one, that your Nargle friend could claim as her own. Nargle friend? Crow pointed down the hallway. The Nargle spirit who calls herself by several names. The woman with the gun is one. Lillian of Gamboa is another. I was once betrothed to Lillian of Gamboa. She was a mundane. My mother favored. Very talented, but not arcane in the least. We drifted apart after I went to the university. I haven't spoken to her in years, Stenstrom said. In this reality, perhaps... She is a Nargle spirit made of sand. She is completely and totally arcane, pretending to be a mundane woman. As such, the universe has branded her an outcast, unfit to love a K-Dog domain. The anatometer I created would subvert the will of the universe, creating a new, superior version of you just for her. Stenstrom puzzled over this, but Crow seemed to tire of the subject. Your pardon! We're going to go up several floors and then enter the main area of the Grunted Clans. That is the heart of Belathouser's realm. The decks have caved in, creating a vast open gallery. Nearby, in the Hall of Many Faces, is the Anatometer and the demon Belathouza herself. Kill the demon and turn the knob of the Anatometer and it shall be done. This horror realm will collapse, the spiral latter shall heal, and your universe shall be safe. My debt repaid. They arrived at a lift door, which was partially open. Crow reached into his cloak, pulling out a small device. He pressed several buttons. Soon a car arrived, and they got in. Please allow me to brief you before we arrive in the Grunded's lair. There are four Grunded clans at work in here in this higher realm. They come here for solace and to feast on the ample foodstuffs that are here for the taking. They are mortal, yet they still feel, above all things, a desire to eat. Camera is a savage place. The clans are at war, not only with myself and those like me, but with each other as well. Seems a grunted feels most alive when it's fighting and tearing. And that's basically all they do. I shall not burden you. The clan's actual names you have already proven unable to move your mouth in the proper fashion. Therefore, I shall identify them by the appellations given to them by the lovely Melazar. Her again! Cat spat. I mean, I loved her in vain and all, but this alternate version of Mel is pissing me off. There are the greens and the reds, the yellows and the blue clans. She named them. What? Cat cried with disgust. No, no, I'm the giver of names, not this messed up version of Melazar, right, G? She chose the names of the color that armor most closely matches, Crow said. Ah, okay, now I will give them proper names. Forget what Mel said. The greens will be the avocados, the reds, the tomatoes, yellows, the custards, and the blues. 
Cat thought a moment. Blue, blue, what food is blue? Are you feeling hungry, darling? Stunstrom asked. I am, yeah, hell yeah. Blue, blue, ah, blue will be the mint clan after the peppermint jelly I love so much. Those are the names you wish to call them? Fiddler Crow asked. Yes, Cat replied, quite happy with herself. So, Stenstrom said, I take it the arm we previously found was an avocado then. Crow agreed. Yes. Now then, I have some accessories here with me that you might find useful. He reached into the pocket of his cloak and drew out two sets of goggles. These will assist you to properly see in the dark. Cat took her set and popped them on, as did Stenstrom. Reminds me of Clovis' scent of bird. She loved goggles. The corridor lit up in the goggles. And take these as well. The Grundeds are immune to your standard shot. These strikers of my own design will suffice. Crow handed Stenstrom several strikers made of a purplish material. He unscrewed his Stenobar strikers and replaced them with crows. These will krill the Grundeds? No, Crow replied. They simply put them to sleep for several hundred years. Years. For your purposes, the net result is the same. Fine. What is our plan? Stenstrom asked. Since we are novices regarding this odd enemy, we shall have to rely upon your expertise. That is wise. In my final service to you, we are going to parlay with the avocados, as we have no way to pass into the main area without first passing through areas under their control. Please allow me to do the talking. Fun times. Do not be alarmed by what you hear. Follow my my lead and do not react. The lift stopped. They slowly exited. Stenstrom held his ints cocked and ready and Cat formed two quick killer STTs which scurried after her. Crow held no obvious weapons. He lightly walked, his ticking ever steady. We are nearly there, Crow said. Gravity has now righted itself without my assistance. Stenstrom recognized the area as part of the botanical lab. A high angled ceiling stood in the dark, covered by wreckage. Outside, through the windows, they no longer saw compacted earth. Here, they saw undulating bands of color, reds, blues, and greens, all twisting together in a torrid fashion over a background of racing stars. Through the windows was pure, seething chaos. They were no longer on Gelt. Now they were standing in the horror realm of Bella Thouser. There was movement all around. Arms dropped down, all clad in tight-fitting green armor. There were legs flopping around, armored torsos, and a few heads mounted on green spinning platforms. The heads were horrible, eyes wide open and fixed in an insane stare, mouths opening and closing, tongues elongated and prehensile like a ruddy tail. Stentrum and Cat got back to back, ready to fight. Crow appeared unimpressed. The various parts began jumping around, consolidating themselves into cohesive assemblages. Four armored torsos levitated into the air, floating on small bluish jets. Three legs and three arms, creating a sort of tripod effect, attached themselves to geared ball and socket joints built into each armored torso. Additionally, six heads in various stages of completeness levitated on blue jets and ratcheted into the housings at various points on both sides of the torso. No heads went to the top of the torso where a head might normally be expected to go. Four of these armored green tripod-like assemblages stood before them in the crawling dark. They spoke in a synthesized fashion. Brona, Tharquil, Bethor, Animus. The Bethor assemblage was missing its right arm. They had slain it in the corridor. Several free-floating arms jostled about and violently had a go at each other, competing for the open spot. After a bloody moment, one came up and took its place, fingers flexing in triumph. The two sides stood there, Stenstrom and Cat in near terror, wondering what was about to happen. One of the assemblages, Tharquil, took a shambling step forward. One of the six heads migrated from its place on its upper right torso and went to the shoulders. It spoke in a partially mechanical voice. Ah, we have the crafty Fiddler Crow in our mist at last. And what have we here? Two more sulfids who appear rather whole and toothsome. Such treasure! 
This is a wondrous surprise. Thaquil, you are a nefarious creature indeed, Crow replied. These sulfids are a gift I was planning on sharing with your unholy grouping. Ah, we see, we see. And what is the price for these rare treasures? For certainly they are not free. Of course not. Safe passage to the Hall of Many Faces and counsel with your Queen Bella Thouser is my price as usual. Another head migrated to the top of Tharquil's shoulders, replacing the previous one. I do not trust this accursed sulfid, Sadler Crow. We should take him and sunder his flesh and increase our wealth. The others are but appetizers. Crow has been our desired main course for centuries. Yes, but of course, Tharquil, you will not have me as per normal. Would I have simply walked into your wretched presence without a second and third option available to me awaiting easy invocation? How soft do you think I have become? A third head came to the top. You cannot hold out against us forever, Fiddler Crow. And we have forever, do we not? We will add your bounty to our wealth. It is all a matter of time, and how much destruction it will take to see it done. Crow wagged his finger. Yes, time that is wasting. These sulfids are but a portion of the treasure I have brought. Give us the rest of the treasure immediately. Give it to us. Alas, I have already given those gifts to your hideous peers out in the great area. They are feasting hearty, even as we speak. The four green assemblages began an agitated stirring. All that wealth to be distributed to the likes of the Arshin Bezelmorphs and the Katie Rusto Laminutas. It is an outrage. The avocado shambled about. We will go and take this well for ourselves and make our enemies suffer. Beth Thor, you remain here with this lot and see that they do not escape. We shall return soon, heaping with fresh treasure. With that, Tharquil, Brona, and Animus shambled away on their green tripod legs, flanked by a neat squadron of flying armored arms, the various heads attached to their bodies shouting war songs as they departed. Bethor, now alone in the corridor with them, appeared quite agitated. One of its six heads came to the top. Where did you get these soulfids, Fiddler Crow? Does it matter? And you are simply going to hand them over? Crow smiled. Bethor, you have a touch of intelligence about you, yes? You know I'm not planning on handing them over at all. Bethor gave a roar and sprang like an uncoiling doll. There was a great confusion of sound. Stenstrom produced several marzibles and sent them flying. Cat jumped up and slashed with Micropoint Silvertech. What? Are you two doing? Crow asked in a haughty, annoying fashion. Stenstrom noticed something. Cat, wait, wait. He took a step forward. What's this? His marzibles were stuck in midair, all four heading for various parts of Bethor's assembled body. Its left arm and its left leg were in the early stages of being cleanly sliced into small strips by Cat's micropoint shadow tech. Delicate slices of flesh and globes of spattering blood issued forth from the wounds. Cat inspected the frozen marzible hanging solidly in midair. Are they TK'd? Crow joined them. No, Beth. Thor is in the early stages of being savagely stabbed and sliced by your remarkable silver tech. Quite an adaptation. I shall devote several hundred years of contemplation towards it at a later time. You have been time socked. I have sped time up a bit, which is incredibly fast even by your standards. I have included you into my circle again, part of the debt I owe. We are now moving at a rate beyond the Grundeds and their petty mindless ways. 
Now, follow me quickly. Crow lightly stepped through the lab towards the forward hatch. Stenstrom and Cat followed. If you had this ability, why bother with these theatrics? Why don't you simply move more quickly in time before? Because I am not your slave, and the debt you hold only goes so far. Also, adding your cells to the time sock might disrupt things a bit in ways I cannot fathom. It all makes for fine intrigue. They went into the corridor. There, stacked everywhere like a grim charnel house, Grundeds lay about, body parts occupying side rooms, alcoves, maintenance hatches, and so on. These are the lesser Grundeds, the ones awaiting their turn to couple with the Great Turk clan. These are the ones you really have to worry about, utterly mindless, except for creating mayhem and chaos. In which case... They are quite clever. Once they merge into a clan, they can enjoy some of the sensory experiences they once did. They feast, and they may also think a bit in a more cognitive fashion. You see, your weapons in Silvertech might have been effective in the initial stages of a complicated battle. However, given the volume of lesser grundeds here, you would have been overwhelmed in short order. They pressed on and entered a lift passage. Crow again pulled the small device from his cloak and summoned a car. When it arrived, inside were more grunded, smaller, in more pieces, fingers, eyes, ears, entrails, and other unidentifiable parts. How can these sad sacks live like this? Cat asked in disgust. What choice do they have? Burn them, G, she said. Burn them, please. I feel for their cursed souls. Crow, you said burning them offers a change into a more satisfying form? Then burn them, please. Stenstrom produced several red holy stones and burned the pieces, watching the fire take root as a colorful, glass-like ornament frozen in movement. Oh, they're burning all right in their time, Crow said. He seemed impressed. You are most compassionate, Countess. The lovely Melazar didn't give these creatures any regard. I am not that woman. I can hear their cries in my mind, and I want them silenced. The list stopped and they stepped out. They were in the upper tier of the ship. At least seven decks had been hollowed out and swept aside, creating a gorge-like cavern of empty space lined with twisted metal. A battle raged all around them, transfixed in time. The Grundeds were locked in a seemingly formless conflagration. There were the green ones, the avocados they had seen earlier, along with a host of disembodied parts in green armor, soaring into the open spaces on bluish jets like fighter planes surrounding a much larger mother ship. They were fighting a host of other Grundeds. There were the ones in red armor, the tomatoes. As with the avocados, there were greater and lesser assemblages of parts, some individual pieces and some coming to savage grips with other pieces. The greater tomatoes were put together in a more of a quadrupedal fashion, having four armored legs mounted on a supporting torso. Mounted parallel to a lower torso was a second torso supporting two arms and two shoulder-mounted heads, like a demented centaur. The tomato's red armor was also put together in a slightly more gothic flair. Mixed into this horrible mess were the custards in a slightly watery-looking yellow armor. The greater custards were assembled in a cart or truck-like fashion, with four torsos knitted together creating a rather flat, roughly rectangular surface. Surrounding the perimeter of the cart were ten legs arranged in caterpillar style. The interior of the cart was studded with reaching arms, at least 20 of them. Some were carrying weapons, others were holding wide-eyed, leering heads. Crow seemed proud of himself. Ah, yes, you see the chaos my ruse has created. Sensorm and Cat held each other for a moment, lost in the horror. He shook off the rush of nausea and began trying to sort out the situation. Sensorm found a good spot and looked about. High above the carnage of the battling clans, near the forward sections of the ship, was a cone of strong white-blue light. Stenstrom knew the light. So too did Cat. Blue light. The demon. Up there, G, do you see it? 
Blue light. I see it. And there is the demon, the stolen personage of my wife. You have the advantage of the time sock. Bella Thouser will, as with the Grundeds here, appear immobile to you. Be advised, the moment you lay hands on the anatomata, the time sock will be released. As with all things, use your time wisely. Crow turned to walk away. Where are you going? Stenstrom asked. I am finished here. The demon is part of my wife. I cannot face her. That is for you to do. Be somewhat comforted. These Grundeds are fully absorbed in each other at present. That should also be of some assistance. He walked away. Mr. Crow? Cat asked. Crow spoke without turning. You are a well-selected, Covis. My debt is paid. With that, he vanished down the corridor. And with that... We come to the center of part four, chapter eight, Gelt. Uh, like I said, this is a long ass chapter and I'm done. We will continue part two of chapter eight next week. This is a pretty weird chapter. They're facing all of these grundeds, these various clans. And I was trying to be as creative as possible when I was coming up with these greater grundeds. You know, how they look. They all are kind of like different shapes. Sort of like an erector set of body parts. Anywho, this video is getting long and my voice is done. Next week we will finish part four chapter eight the second half of gelt and the final chapter which is lunch by the sea and then that is it cat is over next week we come to grips with the demon and blue lights and all the horrific activities that will come with it until then this is ren presents i'm your host ren peace out <laughs>